as I've been so kindly, kindly introduced. Um, my name is Adam Sargent. I'm the co-founder and CEO here at Wama Africa. Uh, Wama is a social enterprise uh, that is based here in Lavington, um, just off North and Gary Road, uh, where the entrance to Brayside School is. And what makes us special is that we not only provide fantastic food and drinks, a great meeting space or function space or birthdays or parties or corporate meetings, um, but that when you're here as a guest at Wama Africa, in the restaurant or in the bar or in the function space, or indeed even if we do outside catering, you will be served by or having been cooked by or coffee is prepared by people with all forms of disabilities and special needs. Now, that could be somebody who is vision impaired, somebody who is deaf, somebody who's uh, got a physical disability, people with certain mental health conditions, uh, people with albinism, um, people with intellectual disabilities such as autism or Down syndrome or cerebral palsy. So all those staff members are trainees, and then we have another batch of staff that are trainers. So everybody here is either a trainee or a trainer. And in a very realistic real world uh, uh, scenario, or not even a scenario, in a real world environment, uh, when guests come and order a cappuccino or have a nice dinner and a bottle of wine, all of that uh, experience is being part of the training of people with special needs. We opened up in July last year, so we've just um, done one year, and we've learned a lot during that period of time. Um, we have done it all on our own. We haven't been funded, we haven't had sponsors, donations, grants or anything. It was a concept that myself and some friends came up with to create a true social enterprise where the profit that is made from the food and beverage sales is what actually pays towards the training. Um, and we've got a beautiful facility here in Lavington, uh, conference room, swimming pool, indoor and outdoor dining space and art gallery as well. Um, so we very much welcome as many people as we can get to come in and enjoy breakfast, lunch or dinner seven days a week, because that's actively what allows us to provide the training uh, to our team members um, that are differently abled. The end goal of the training is to place uh, our trainees into long-term employment um, with an employer partner. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So uh, it's all about for us as a restaurant to operate normally the way any other restaurant would. Um, but the special part of it is that the people providing that service have got a special need or disability and they're here for about three months and then they go into long-term employment. Um, so yes, it's a fantastic cycle. Uh, WAMA stands for Wisdom, Ability, Motivation and Access. Um, and that's really our, our guiding philosophy, really. Um, we believe that knowledge and skills are power, uh, and that's by imparting that knowledge and skill onto people, particularly people that have got a special need or disability, we're empowering them uh, to be a fully productive member of society, to believe in themselves and to um, take charge of their lives. And we focus on people's ability. We acknowledge and we provide a safe and supportive supportive working environment, uh, understanding the disability um, or special need or mental health concern. But we really try to focus on what the person's abilities are, where they can shine, what their strengths are, what they love to do. And through that, we motivate them. We understand them as an individual and we try to inspire success based on their individual skills and talents, their abilities. Now, the access for all is really important for us. That goes to our slogan, fusion and inclusion. We believe that everybody should be welcome here at WAMA and that also all people should be able, if they fit the criteria, to be able to undertake the training, um, no matter who they are or where they come from. So we really like to be a property that is fully inclusive. Um, and one example of that is that it's not just about actually being inclusive from a disability point of view. It's also from our guest point of view. So we have a prayer room. So if we have Muslim customers come in and they'd like to pray, there's a room dedicated for that. Uh, we have an accessible toilet for somebody who's in a uh, 
uh, wheelchair. We have lots of facilities and our whole training philosophy is around making sure that WAMA is available for everybody to enjoy, be it a trainee or be it a guest. So why we exist and why we set this up, uh, I've, I'm a management consultant by trade. I've worked you know, throughout the world, um, primarily in commercial environments, but also in the charity sector. And it's very clear that uh, there is a huge population here in Kenya, as there is around the world, that have got a disability or special need. Um, and they have limited or no access to uh, training, to career opportunities, uh, to an opportunity that allows them to believe in themselves so that they can actually take charge of their lives and be a, a, a wonderful, productive member of society. Uh, we understand that obviously youth unemployment is a huge issue here, and that obviously impacts people with special needs even further. Um, the disability uh, population of, of Kenya is very significant. Um, and part of that is, if you don't recognize, is that you might not recognize somebody with a disability, particularly if it's something like low spectrum autism or cerebral palsy, um, you might not know that they're disabled. Or it could be somebody who is albino that actually a lot of people don't classify as a disability, um, but not understanding that uh, people with albinism often have extremely severe short, uh, shortage of sight, as well as obviously sensitivity to sun and so on, which actually really does impact the way they have to live their lives. On top of that, there's also the stigma uh, that's associated to many people with disabilities or special needs, um, particularly intellectual disabilities and also mental health concerns as well. Um, so it's a big problem um, that a lot of people in society, not just in Kenya, but throughout the world, see people with a disability or special need as not being able to potentially work, not be able to take part of society, not be able to pay taxes, not be able to um, you know, be a member of a, what we call a normal society. And that's so far from the truth. Uh, and that's why we focus on people's abilities. And obviously every disability has a spectrum. Um, some people with more severe disabilities, less. But for us, it is all about understanding people as individuals and tailor making the training to them and also tailor making um, the employment opportunity to them, identifying employers that could work with people with all the various forms of disabilities and special needs. So what we do is we um, work with many different organizations uh, to find or to refer people with various forms of special needs and disabilities and really include them in our operations here. Um, we focus on capacity building, teaching them the hard and soft skills. We do a lot of advocacy, sensitization, community outreach, both here at the property, um, but also by visiting various employers, people who want to employ people with disabilities, uh, and really trying to focus on the long-term goal of getting as many people as we can in themselves and potentially their families. Um, now, I'll talk a little bit more about customer service going on, but a lot of people go, oh, well, is it just making sure or making everybody work in hospitality? And, and that's not uh, what we focus on. Our focus is on providing um, life skills training, employability training, and then really focusing on customer service. So it means that people can go into many different roles at the end of the training. They could be working in hospitality if they like, if that's their passion, kitchen assistants, hosts, waiters, baristas, uh, working behind the bar, but they also might be a junior sales officer or an accounts clerk. They could be working in any manner of industry. We do a lot of the practical training all on site. And like I said, it takes about three to six months for a trainee to be work ready. Um, and we're flexible with that because each trainee is an individual. And that's what we really do focuses, focus on is identifying them as an individual and sometimes people take longer to be ready to work and enter the workplace um, other people you know learn a lot faster and have got more confidence much quicker 
Um, we use a program called Tipsy to provide uh, the theoretical academic training, uh, which is an online learning platform where people can, uh, our trainees log in and do different modules, such as everything from uh, customer service essentials through to uh, understanding empathy, um, through to the practical skills of, of kitchen or barista, uh, even financial management as well. At the moment, uh, we have about uh, so we have eight trainees undertaking training at the moment, and uh, we're hoping to scale that up again now. The property is a very large property, um, but because it's self-funded and it is all about how many customers we have, the money that we can make from the food and drinks and then pay for the training, obviously it fluctuates with the season. And as we've just come out of a very cold period and with all the elections, uh, that's where we had to scale down the amount of training we could do. But at any one time in a normal operating model, us ourselves in a sustainable approach can uh, take 16 trainings at one time. So the, the cycle is when people join us, it's really about looking at them and doing an assessment of the individual and seeing who they are as a person, building up their confidence, letting them uh, feel confident to be out on their own. A lot of people come here, they're very shy, they've faced quite often stigma, even abuse. And so it is about making them feel safe, making them understand this is a supportive environment, but it's also a training environment and it is the real world. So we don't shelter people here. We make sure they're safe and supported, but this is a real world scenario. So sometimes there might be a angry customer. Sometimes, you know, there could be an issue that they have to resolve. And that's part of the training as well about how to work, how to be part of society where not everything is rosy. Um, and I think that's a really important thing because it would be irresponsible for us to provide the training, prepare them for the workplace and get them into a, a long-term job if they weren't ready to face the challenges that life brings. So we very much uh, educate that in the first couple of weeks in the first month is really all about the life skills training. As they build up their confidence, uh, then we look at the employability skills about making sure people understand they have to show up for time, on time for their shift, even early to make sure they're changed in uniform and they're ready. The fact that if they're sick or if they're running late, they need to, uh, to communicate to their supervisors in advance. If they're sick, they need a medical certificate. Um, and that's a really big part of why we actually pay all the trainees. They don't pay us, we actually pay them a salary, is so that they can understand even basic budgeting but they can understand actually how important it is to uh, work in a workplace with policies and procedures uh, with a HR department um, where if you want to take leave, you need to apply, where you have to follow a code of conduct and that prepares them for the workplace. And then we focus the training on customer service. So yes, we're a hospitality environment and some people have a passion, if they're a little bit more shy, they might work uh, in the brister section behind the coffee machine or in the bar or in the kitchen. Other people love being out and about and talking to customers once they've built up their confidence. But it's all about understanding customer service so we can prepare them for stage four, which is the employment and matching them with an employer in an industry that is desirable for them. Um, now, when we're training people, it is about one-on-one -on -one training. It is about understanding them as a person, pairing them up with a trainer that they get along with, that they feel safe with, and basically learning as they go, talking and interacting with the customers, talking with our, our staff that are trainers, um, allocating them a mentor who can they can talk to and share their issues and problems with. Um, we never force uh, our trainees to tell, them, tell us our, their background or even to go into depth about their disability. It's a natural part of their journey here where they'll open up, uh, they'll talk more about what their abilities are, what they like to do, and sometimes they'll talk more about their disability. But we're very careful not to exploit that factor. Um, when we have media come here, when we have uh, events or whatever, we try to make sure that the trainees are not seen as a person with disability. Let's photograph them, let's hear their story. Sometimes they don't want to tell that story and that's completely fine. It is about actually providing the training, providing the mentorship, and then where they prefer us or other people to speak on their behalf, 
behalf of advocating for their rights and advocating uh, for how well they can actually play a very, very productive uh, role in society. So the customer service uh, training is really, really an important uh, aspect of what we do. And it's one of the things we learned. At the beginning, we did focus training on hospitality, but we didn't want to say that all trainees that come to one have to then go into a hospitality setting. That's not realistic. Um, and it went against what we believe in is understanding them as an individual and letting them follow their passions. And what we did though, see very quickly, it was that so many customers would give us a feedback that the, the customer service here is great. It's better than I've experienced even in a, a normal restaurant. And that allowed us to really identify that hospitality is such a unique and perfect ideal training ground for the skills of customer service. Um, people with a disability and a special need often have more empathy uh, and humility than somebody who's fully able because of the, uh, the difficulties they've gone through. They're, they can understand the customer in a restaurant better. Um, but we train in a restaurant environment how to look at a customer, how to watch if their, their glass of juice is getting a little bit empty and maybe they want to refill. How at the end of the meal, would they like a coffee or would perhaps they like dessert? if they're looking around the grounds and their job is as a, a waitress, but then they notice something has blown over or a, there's a napkin flying around, to actually be proactive and use their initiative to go pick that up. Or if a guest comes in to walk, welcome them, take them on a tour of the property, they have to use their initiative for problem solving. They have to be attentive and responsive. They have to be able to communicate and learn how to communicate with people from all walks of life, from uh, government ministers and uh, very senior government officials to diplomatic people to the everyday Kenyan customer who will walk in here but has their own uh, issues or uh, happiness or frustrations they have to learn how to deal with many different people and that teaches them actually the essence of customer service and then that customer service can then be applied to any industry um, I like to use the example of a government office, um, and I won't say anyone in particular, but anywhere in the world, if you have to maybe get a replacement document, for example, or apply for something, it can be a bit of a frustrating, long, daunting experience. And quite often you're in a hurry, you go into that office, you might not get the assistance you need immediately, and that can not be very nice. But if somebody who's been trained in customer service, particularly somebody with a special need of disability, is there to greet you upon arrival, to help understand your need, to listen to you, and then actually tell you which office to go to or which department or which floor or level, which desk to go see, uh, to talk about, okay, there could be a potential wait time. Perhaps you'd like to go take a ticket and then go get a coffee, come back in half an hour. Having that customer service experience at the beginning takes away all that frustration. It disarms a aggressive or frustrated customer and actually gives them such a higher level of customer service experience uh, that helps the whole entire organization. Somebody who might want to go buy a car, if they walk into a car dealership and they're greeted by somebody who's frustrated, who's not interested in their job, who doesn't want to listen to them, is the customer likely to buy a car from them? Possibly not, but greeted by somebody who's been trained in customer service, who reads them, who listens to their, uh, their questions, listens to their needs, uh, who is suggestive and uses their initiative, that person's got a far better opportunity of selling them a car. Somebody in insurance or somebody at a hospital reception desk, basically any industry you can think of, customer service is the very, much uh, upfront and essential skill that's needed. And all of our trainees uh, become specialists in customer service. I talk about understanding people as individuals. And part of that is to not just focus on the work environment, not just focus on what their career might be, but also getting them involved in fitness, in music, in dance, in sport, um, in anything that actually opens up their mind to be able to understand their interests. Once lay. So we have dance boot workout here. We have um, 
uh, studio could also be involved on that. We do uh, swimming lessons for our team members and also the public's very welcome to use the pool. We talk about fashion and fashion design, uh, music theatre and, and Margareta um, was here for one of the uh, demonstrations of the musical theatre um, and one of the rehearsals of that. So it's about really understanding what makes people happy and what they're passionate about and then we can actually provide better training. We select the trainings based on uh, a whole bunch of criteria, but really trying to understand who has the opportunity to provide great customer service and who has the ability to um, take on long-term employment in a customer service role. Somebody who hasn't had a previous economic opportunity um, and that might be uh, people who had no opportunity to even attend secondary school. It'd be people who've been able to go to one of the secondary schools that supports people with disabilities or special needs, um, but hasn't been able to go beyond secondary school. And, and that is actually with when I talk to a lot of the various uh, industry bodies and organisations that support all the various disabilities and special needs, uh, that's one of the collective concerns is that there is quite a lot of support for people uh, to get to secondary school and, and to finish secondary school. But beyond that, um, there's very, very, very little opportunity. Um, so that's basically what we're trying to fill that gap is that bridge between some level of secondary uh, uh, learning or people who haven't had that opportunity, but taking them into WAMA, training them, um, preparing them for a workplace, preparing them for a, a career and letting them enter society. The reason people say, oh, why do you say limited access to economic development is because some people um, now, and this is not casting any judgment, but some people with a disability or special need have uh, taken many opportunities from training, from UN programs, from diplomatic uh, initiatives that are there. And it's become a bit of a lifestyle for them. And that's one of the challenges we face when selecting the trainees is making sure that the trainees are the right fit to the culture, to the team environment, and nobody enters as better than somebody else. Um, and so for those trainees that have, have found a, a way to earn a living from the system, that's absolutely you know, their choice and something that they've had to do to survive, and I have no disrespect for them. But for our training here, it's more about a nurturing environment from a, um, from a beginning level somebody who is open to training, open to learning, um, and open to you know, undertaking a long-term career after this with an employer. We work with a lot of the different organizations um, uh, throughout the country, uh, also Aga Khan Hospital and uh, Dr. Chosky's uh, Albinism Foundation. Uh, so it is uh, quite uh, daunting sometimes of how many applicants we have uh, we've got over 400 applicants in our system that are applied through either one of the organisations or through hearing about us online or in, uh, social media and so on, or just walking in here and, and bringing their CVs. Now, we can't train everybody, and so we look at we, uh, what abilities can be adapted to the workplace. And sadly, um, you know, we can only do as much as we can, and people with some forms of severe intellectual disability um, we're not able to take on board um, because we have to be realistic about what we do. As I keep on mentioning, the, the long-term objective is all about them entering long-term employment once I've finished here um, in a variety of roles and a variety of industries. Um, because once they enter employment in an industry that they're passionate about, in a job that they like, we provide ongoing support for them and also for the employer, but it means that they can sustain themselves, their lives, and quite often their families. So we work with the employers to understand what type of disability or special need could fit their organization very easily without much adoption. It's all about reducing the barriers or the fear um, for an employer to employ somebody with a disability or special need. We do that by having people simply come here to WAMA, 
talking to her, myself and the team to have a look at what we've done to make one more accessible um, and uh, inclusive. But also we uh, go to workplaces to conduct disability audits um, and that can be looking at the physical structure of the workplace, any physical changes that might be need, may, uh, need to be made, but also looking at the culture and the policies, procedures, what sensitivity training do we need to provide, do we need to adapt the workplace policies and procedures so that actually it will be a safe and supportive environment for the person with a disability. Um, our graduates, and you can see some of them there in the photos, they thrive in all types of workplaces. Uh, this is some of our outcomes and as I mentioned at the very beginning, for the first year, uh, we have not received any donations, funding, grants or sponsorship, and it was so that we could really refine our model, uh, learn from it and make sure that what we're doing was successful and had the impact that we desired. Um, and you can see here, uh, you know, we've overall over the last year, there's seven types of disabilities and special needs that we've trained. Uh, we have done 27 trainees in the first year, 19 of which were female, 8 which were male. Uh, 14 trainees have entered into employment, uh, and four trainees actually decided they wanted to study further because the career path they wanted, uh, or they understood they wanted to go into from their time here at WAMA, needed some further training, and so we've linked them up with the appropriate training providers to do that. So for us, it's a fantastic success, but it also shows how much more we can actually do. Uh, some of our graduates you can see here are pictured. Um, Kennedy, uh, who is based in a wheelchair, but he's one of the fastest uh, people I know. He's one minute I'll be uh, looking inside and he's in the office. The next minute he's out on one part of the garden. Next minute he's by the pool talking to guests there. Um, so Kennedy was uh, one of our initial trainees uh, and he's got a fantastic personality, he loves IT and he's now been working uh, for an NGO in client relations. Uh, Shirlene, uh, she's working as a tourist, so the hospital. She has such a fantastic, she's a single mother. Um, she, we actually had a staff uh, fun day here on Tuesday where all the staff and the pennies were able to, uh, to go swimming and have a, have a fun day. Uh, just her sense of sass and, and uh, her fun outlook on life is really inspiring for people and it provides fantastic customer service and she now actually works here as one of our service trainees, uh, trainers. Uh, James has a intellectual disability um, and he worked both as a host but also he, he liked the barista side of the training um, and with his particular form of intellectual dis disability the routine of how to make a coffee um, really worked well for him and he was able to pick up the skills very quickly but he also for short periods of time loved interacting with guests meeting them asking them about their day and taking them to the seat uh, and he now works in another customer service role um, outside one so for us we've got many other success stories but this gives a great uh, understanding of some of the success uh, that our program achieves uh vanessa here in this photo uh this is a really proud day we had a um a australian government function here held at the property uh and she as part of her last shift was the, the key waitress for the table uh, for the australian high commissioner and some vip guests uh and she now works actually in mombasa um for a company called watu and she works in finance as a finance data officer um, entering actually all the finance and accounts into their um, electronic system. And the feedback from her employer, the feedback from her is nothing short of amazing. She's already been promoted in the time there. So now that we know what we're doing works really well, we really scale up our operations. Um, and we can do that by now trying to attract uh, sponsorship, attracting donations, looking at grants um, and seeing how we can get support to grow. 
Now, there's two ways for us to grow. The first is to increase the amount of training we do here. Um, we've got a massive property and as much as we can train up to about 16 people ourselves at any one time, the property ourselves and with our staffing that we have, we can train up to 40 trainees uh, a three month cycle. So we've got a long way we can actually go even within this property here. We also offer short programs and that's for people with more severe disabilities um, or mental health issues. It gives them a taste of of employment um, and there's two programs that can be part-time or full-time one or two week programs depending on their form of disability and that's another part of us trying to make sure that we are fully inclusive that even if somebody doesn't meet the criteria and we can't provide a safe place a uh, supportive place for a long-term program we can do that for short programs as well what we also want to do, and one of the things that we learned is that uh, from the very beginning, we had trainees apply from all over the country to come here to Wama in Lavington, Nairobi, to undertake the training, partly because they've never seen any opportunity of training before post-secondary school, also because it's very, very rare for training to actually be paid. So quite often for many of them, the very first ever received it's not come from the family or friends. So for us, that was a great kind of uh, understanding, but it also posed uh, the issue of the fact that it really just that and and then get employment uh, is something that we need to carefully consider. And so that made us understand that we need to open up more centers like Wild Africa and indeed even further beyond Kenya. Um, but not necessarily as well as in, uh, let's say, Diani for example, it would have more seafood on the menu. The pricing would be, would be different. If we opened something up that was in Machakos or Pakamega, it might be more of a Chomas style restaurant. Uh, the pricing would be cheaper and so on. So what we can do is we can open up multiple Wama Africa training uh, social enterprises in a hospitality setting, but we adapt to the local market, but still provide the same training um, and using the same methodology and operational approach. The cost of the training is quite costly. Um, and that's why, like I said, for us providing the training ourselves for the first year, we've had to fluctuate the number of trainees based on how busy we are um, and so on. And it equates to essentially 98,000 uh, shillings per trainee per month. Now that includes their, um, their allowance, their transport and so on that we pay them. It covers the cost of the training and with all the details you can see there that we have to provide. Um, and so it seems like a significant amount of money, but the, the fact and the truth is, is that it is a, a reasonably high investment, but it's a very short -term investment paying what equates to just under 300,000 for a trainee in a three month period, takes them from essentially having no opportunity, no exposure to training or employment, um, to then actually being able to enter a long-term career and being able to support themselves, to be able to even support their families and have a, a long-term career. So it's a high impact uh, short-term investment um, and the results speak for themselves. We are now looking at partnerships, um, also uh, sponsors or any sort of level of donation uh, or funding to allow us to do more. And we've been talking to some organizations and employers, um, people who want to employ trainees uh, in the workplace that are, or employ people with disabilities in the workplace of how they can help us um, be able to provide more training, training to trainees so they can enter those uh, companies, but also uh, any people uh, who want to support what we do 
Um, and these are just some of the examples of the way people uh, were hoping people would support us, but we're very flexible uh, to how people can be involved. The nice thing about what we do is that it's very sustainable. Obviously, WAMA without any funding can operate itself and can continue providing training on a uh, sort of small capacity, up to 16 trainees per, per time. Um, but we can scale up as fast as the partnerships or funding or donations or grants come in. We've got a very strong team here. But it also means that if somebody can only fund a trainee for a short period of time or has to divert their, uh, their sponsorship or their donation, we can also scale it down um, and without it impacting people or impacting the organization as a whole. So for me, that was the ultimate goal of making sure that our social enterprise model was sustainable, um, but also scalable as well. So that comes to the end of my presentation. My contact details are there on the, the screen, um, but I'd really invite you all to come to WAMA uh, to experience it yourselves. Um, we have uh, you know, events coming up all the time and we are on social media, as you can see there. Uh, so we're always posting about what events that we have on the property. Um, and yes, I, I hope to meet you all very soon. I'm now open to any questions that you may have. Adam, that was a wonderful, a wonderful presentation. I know there's lots of questions that will follow and comments. And I want to encourage members to please uh, put up your hands. I'm looking down our list of uh, participants to see if your hands are up. And I'm also going to look at the chat box in case you drop anything there. But I want to ask that we contribute. I know this is an area where Rotary as a family and the Rotary Club of Nairobi have a great impact. And I'll say just one word of wisdom, I think that will help to open up the floor for questions. I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to reach my destination. And that quote is great not just for those who need to adjust their sales, who are indeed the beneficiaries of WAMA's training, but also tells us a little bit about the impact of education, training, and literacy on changing the lives of all, but in particular, those with disability or those who are differently abled. I want to open up the floor, Adam. I know that there are questions from our participants today. I'd like to open it up. I'd like to ask PP Ritesh Barot kindly do unmute and contribute. Thank you, thank you, President Dr. Josephine, and thank you to our, our wonderful speaker. I, I just have one comment. Actually, it's uh, fantastic, fantastic the initiative uh, which uh, you have championed and uh, amazing work being carried out uh, and so organized. My goodness. Uh, I think that's that's the only contribution I have. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vicky Ritesh. It's wonderfully organized. I was hoping we'd see a few more pictures of your particular setting, but you spoke today about the training. I know the organization includes a well-organized setup there. So we'll be looking online to see what more we can see of the setting, Adam. But yes. again, well organized. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the facilities there. Certainly, I mean, yes, indeed. We've got a, a beautiful garden uh, set up with a, a lovely large pond and water feature uh, that lots of people like uh, sitting around or taking photos, even for special events. Um, we have a very large space for functions, be it a, a black tie, red carpet dinner um, of up to 400 people, or for smaller things like birthdays and anniversaries and celebrations. Uh, we have lots of space for our walking customers uh, to come in and enjoy, enjoy breakfast, lunch, or dinner. We're open from 8 a.m. until late every day. Um, and that can be indoors or outdoors. We've got a lovely indoor dining area, 
you know, like I said, a very beautiful uh, space outside to have private meetings or private dinners or celebrate with family and friends uh, and mix with other people. We've got a lovely bar that does great cocktails and we have a very good wine list. Um, our food is a whole range of, uh, of continental things, things like uh, red snapper with the garlic butter sauce, mayonnaise potatoes, uh, very nice steaks, to things like what we call wama choma, so our version of uh, choma, which is a, a grilled ribeye steak uh, with ugali and kachimbari, whole tilapia as well we offer. Um, beautiful chicken wings, I mean, a whole wide range of menus. We have pizzas, we have burgers, uh, kids items. And for groups, uh, we also can do uh, buffets as well. So we're very versed in catering for all the different type of folks. We have meeting rooms, um, large and small. We can do conferences indoor and outdoor. We also have a beautiful swimming pool for people who want to use the swimming pool. Uh, so lots of facilities here. Thank you, it sounds amazing. We shall be coming soon. We're Thank actually you. looking for venues such as that. I want to just ask, do you do vegetarian food too? By any yes, sense? we do. We've got a, a large variety and that I think is a, a great uh, example of how we are focused on the philosophy of inclusion, our slogan. Um, so we make sure we've got a large variety of vegetarian food or vegan options, but also catering to people with special dietary requirements such as gluten intolerance or lactose intolerance. Thank you so much, Adam. I see a hand up and that is none other than Dr. Margareta Ogashevi. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you, Adam. I thought it was a fabulous presentation. Very exciting, and it is what um, I saw and wrote about myself, about your organization. I just wonder, could you tell us about the, how you, what was the training of trainers? Because you have focused on the um, very individualized approach to these individuals with special needs who have also gone through training. Uh, obviously, it's very um, delicate process, how have you found or taught yourself the trainers to facilitate that process? Mm. And, that, and that's a fantastic question. I mean, we don't employ a traditional method of employment uh, by seeking people who have got um, specialist skills in a disability background. We look for personality. Um, we look that they have a minimum level of uh, whatever skills that be it a chef, be it a customer service person, be it an administrator or an accountant, that they've got a, a very good skill set. Uh, so that way when they're training, it passes on naturally. But really it is about finding people that have got a warm heart that are ex not only open to the idea of training, but uh, that drives them, that they want to take the patience, take the time to give their skills to other people. So it is a a, a very interactive um, way of employment where we have a, a multiple stage interview process and then a trial process to make sure that they fit the team. Okay, thank you. We have on the call this afternoon, Professor Jared Akama Onyari and Lady Justice Joyce and Watch amongst others. And I want to ask Professor Onyari because he's an educationist if he has any contribution to our conversation. And then later ask Lady Justice Joyce I'll watch from the human rights and social justice perspective, if she has any comments on our wonderful presentation on training and empowerment for young adults living with special needs and disabilities from that perspective. Over to you, Professor Onyari. All right, if, Professor, I don't know if you're there. If not, I'd like to ask Lady Justice Joyce and Watch to perhaps make a comment on basic education and literacy for persons with disabilities from the human rights perspective. Lady Justice Joyce and Watch. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, 
I he can you hear me? I joined late because I'm having problem with problems mm -hmm. with my connection. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Sorry, that's why I joined very late. First, I want to congratulate uh, uh, Mr. Adam. You're doing wonderful work, really wonderful work. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. It's, it's not many people who can do this kind of work. People don't have the patience and the passion to do what you're doing. Very well done. I read in the one of the clips uh, late as I logged in, but I nevertheless read in one of the clips clips that um, once trained um, some of these um, <clears throat> young people with um, special needs end up disrupting their supports network and um, because they have to, they are long time employed elsewhere. Have you uh, have you that do you find that this works or or or, or how, how does this work? It caught my attention when I read it. In, I think it was the second or third or fourth clip. Yeah. Please. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for your question, Lady Justice. Um, the support network of anybody, um, people like yourself and myself, or particularly with people with special needs and disabilities, mm -hmm. is extremely important to general well-being. Um, it allows people to be productive in the workplace, to focus on their employment or their training. Um, and what we found is that when we started WAMA, we had people applying, like you said, potentially who had other opportunities. Um, and this was something else they wanted to try to fit in, or people who had traveled from far away uh, and left family or a support network to come for the training here in Arabia and Lavington. And we realized that those people weren't able to take on the skills uh, or the learning that we were teaching here um, and found it a hard environment to be in because uh, for somebody who had already had lots of opportunities, they weren't really interested in um, necessarily learning more skills. It was more about how to just earn money. Um, for somebody from far away, it's quite often unsettling because they're missing their family, they don't know Nairobi and so on. And so that's where we're now focused on uh, more localized recruitment um, and understanding a individual support network uh, before and during their joining process of their onboarding with us to make sure that actually they can focus on the training uh, here. At the same time, it's important to mention that you know we provide a safe and supportive environment, but not sheltered. So people, uh, Kennedy, as you saw, he was in a wheelchair. He used to come from uh, he used to have to take, I won't say where he's from, uh, breach of confidentiality, but he used to have to take two matatus to come here in a wheelchair. He did that every day to come and every day to go home. Mm -hmm. And some people said, oh, why don't you provide him transport or fare? Haven't you got a bus for him? And as a self-funding organisation, we don't have the money for that. But also it's not realistic for him to be able to get a job which would provide uh, a special vehicle. Maybe in the best case scenario that would happen, but in the realistic sense, that's not normal. And Kennedy would do, make the effort of going, would do welfare checks to make sure he'd arrive safely and so on. Quite often staff would travel with him, but it was about making sure it's a realistic way for him to be able to be involved. So he had a support network um, and he was able to support himself to get to and from work. And that was really important for us to understand that, that realistic uh, approach to training and preparation for long-term employment is what's essential. Thank you. Wonderful work you're doing for humanity. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well done. I want to ask my deputy, Kalpa. Kalpa, do you have any contribution, something you might want to add to the conversation? Um, not a contribution, it's just on an experience I've, I had a few years ago uh, when there was this thing about dining with the blind. Um, we, uh, so it, like, we were all told to leave our phones and everything outside and go into a place which was completely dark. So we were like, um, and then I think all the waiters and everybody were all blind. Um, it was a wonderful experience to see that how when we are inside, we realize it's so dark, we had to use our hands to feel where the cutlery and where everything was. And 
we were just given food and we didn't know what we were eating although we did say that i'm a vegetarian so i did get a vegetarian uh, food but then suddenly you realize that you started talking so loud because we thought the other person next to us couldn't hear because we couldn't see so that was like a wonderful experience and then uh, this um, there's this restaurant palette palette cafe i think they also have all of them who are disabled i mean like it's uh, mr adam i think you you're doing a wonderful a fantastic job and um, even one experience i had was one of an uh, one, an art exhibition one of my friends art exhibition i think all same thing i think i don't know if it was the same person who said you said who was in a wheelchair who was there because there was somebody who was in a wheelchair who was serving us at that time uh, and like i said you're doing a fantastic job thank you actually just to, to point out a palette cafe um, i worked at and, and built up the model there before i uh, created Wama. so uh, palette cafe is such a great example of how easy it is for a um, an employer like a cafe to employ even if it's one form of disability people that are deaf and incorporating them fully into the workplace and how what you know they provide such a fantastic level of service fantastic food cafe so it's such a role model of an employer employing people uh, with it Thank you. Uh, vegetarians and guests, I'm hoping we still have you there. It's a few minutes after two, and I think it's time for us to resume our normal activities with the rest of the hours of the day. But um, I'd like to pass the vote of thanks, and I'll ask uh, my deputy, therefore, to raise the final toast when I'm done with the vote of thanks. So Adam, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Nairobi, I'd like to thank you very specially for joining our fellowship this afternoon. We have really benefited from your inspiring presentation. And in sharing as you've done, I want us to remember that really 80 to 90% of persons with disabilities are unemployed in our setting. And that employment is important for them in order that they can have a decent life and that they can feel that they are included in the society where they live. And so therefore, WAMA, wisdom, ability, motivation, and access is a real gift for persons with disability and also a gift for the larger community, who some of us would want to contribute to improving the lives and welfare of persons with disability, but don't have a tool. And so therefore, whatever support we're able to give as individuals, <clears throat> as a club, and through friends and other Rotarians to Wama, I know that this is a well-placed input, a partnership that improves not just the persons with disability, but our community at large. We want to thank you so much, Adam, for what you're doing the capacity building, the life skills training, especially the customer focus around employability, and also just training persons with disability in their passion. This is a really well thought through training program. And more than that, the fact that you said that it's a sustainability package that you're giving them. So that after that, they don't need any further training for their life. It really is amazing and then the pictures you shared kennedy where the wheels didn't stop him from being an it expert and charlene's smile i was caught up captivated and couldn't look at anyone else on that page thank you so much and so as we end we want to also remember that when everyone says to a person with disability you can't determination says to them yes you can Yes, you can. I think that is so apt today. Thank you, through Wama. Yes, you can is the rallying call. Thank you very much. 
I'm sure that many will be in touch with you after this and we look forward to engaging with you in many more ways. Having thank you so that much for those kind words. Thank you. Having passed that vote of thanks, I know we will give you something physical to put on a shelf shortly and my deputy will see to that. And in the same vein, I want to hand over to Kalpa, Deputy President, to therefore raise the final toast. Over to you, Kalpa. Okay, let me raise our final toast to Rotary the world over. Please, if you're holding your coffee or put your hand to your chest. Rotary world over. Rotary. Rotary the world over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy President. And thanks to all who logged in and joined us for this amazing, empowering and inspiring presentation. You're now free and able to go back to your afternoon of duty and service. And for those who want to mingle, we'll be on the line for another five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Um, for those who are interested, I've actually shared the PDF of the presentation in the chat group as well. So you could download that if you like. Um, my contact details are on there. And um, of course, Margareta uh, knows how to get in contact with me very well as well. Margareta, yeah. you're Yes. May I also recommend that any of us who have a, a, an evening, an afternoon, a morning, to um, take a cup of coffee or tea or a meal. They should stop off in Lavington and look for Adam and Wama because it's a really lovely place and the food is also very fine. So, or just to say hello <laughs> and meet his staff. They're fascinating, lovely people. Yes, thank you. And thank you again, Adam. Thank you all very much. Um, at that note, I must run. I can see there's uh, some customers out there that I think are waiting to speak to me. So uh, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> wow.